the Lord's Supper is offered and nobody comes forward. Oh, did I get the signal correct here that I'm off of mute there? Okay, we're good. We're good. Okay. Uh, as I was saying, you know, sometimes they, in the Sunday evenings, we hear the communion meditation. And nobody needs to receive it. They've already had it in the morning. But, uh, you know, I just, I look forward to these communion meditations in the morning and evening. It's, it's to me, it's just as important part of the service as the singing, the prayer, because that's a moment dedicated every Sunday. Think about that. Every Sunday, we think specifically about the atoning work of Jesus Christ. Now, hopefully you will always have a preacher at this church that will share that every Sunday. But to have time set aside in the middle of the service for that and that alone is precious. Don't, uh, don't take that for granted. That's a beautiful thing that one of, the, one of the things the Stone Campbell Church tradition offers that others don't is that, uh, that weekly communion with the Lord at the Lord's table. It's just a kind of a unique gift. So don't, don't take that for granted. This evening we'll be in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2 and... Uh, we're going to do a little, little bit of straight talk about the church. Now, straight talk as opposed to what? Well, as opposed to maybe beating around the bush sometimes and uh, not, not getting down to the issues. And what we're talking about discipleship, and we started uh, from the ground up here, and we've talked about what our fellowship is. Uh, and um, tonight, just uh, we, we talked about a new community last time and how significant that is because you come to church on a weekly basis or two to three times a week and you take that drive you pull up you see the door you know the pews you're familiar with the place and you forget maybe the miracle that is church it's a miracle that we're here and that this community of believers has lasted thousands of years has completely enveloped the earth march through the timelines and march through geographical boundaries we're a part of a miracle this evening called the church but let, I want us to talk about it a little bit tonight so if you're in Ephesians chapter 2 uh, go down then to verse 11 verse 11 if you please stand with me for the reading of God's Word tonight in Ephesians chapter 2 starting in verse 11 so then, so then Remember that at one time you were Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcised by those called the circumcised, done by hand in the flesh. At that time you were without the Messiah, excluded from the citizenship of Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, with no hope and without God in the world. But, it's my favorite term we'll see in Scripture, there's always an exception with Christ. Verse 13, but... Now in Christ Jesus, you, are far, you who are far away have been brought near by the blood of the Messiah. For he is our peace who made both groups one and tore down the dividing wall of hostility in his flesh. Verse 15, he did away with the law of the commandments and regulations so that he might create in himself one new man from the result of two resulting in peace. He did this so that he might reconcile both to God in one body through the cross and put the hostility to death by it. When Christ came, he proclaimed the good news of peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access by one spirit to the Father. So then you're no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. The whole building is being, is being knitted together in him and is growing into a holy sanctuary in the Lord. Verse 22, in whom you also are being built together for God's dwelling in the Spirit. You may be seated. Lord, right now we dedicate the reading of your word. Thank you for these words. We get to share them together, study them, pray over them, learn from them, and obey them. Lord, there's some issues in the church we don't like to attack head on. You call us to deliver the truth. Although to deliver it with love, the goal is to deliver the truth. Heavenly Father, if we cannot be willing to pursue truth at all costs in the church, 
No one else will be willing to because we are the only ones who have the truth and that is your word. We pray, Lord, that you continue to reveal yourself to us this evening through your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, you've probably been there, done that. You have a project you need to work on, and so you decide, I could go to the store and buy tools and spend a small fortune to work on a project that really isn't that big a deal. Or you can talk to some people you know at church. You can talk to some neighbors, and you can borrow some tools. And in turn, you kind of develop this little community where then uh, they borrow tools from you and you borrow tools from others. And by the time you get this little community built and you're ready to do your project and you've made your connections for tools, you don't have any of the tools you need in your house either because people are now borrowing them. <laughs> They'll gladly accept your help on their projects, but when it's time for you to ask for a little help, everyone's just a little too busy. Been there, done that? When we look at the church, tonight I want us to consider what I believe to be three main enemies of the church. We, we see that these enemies show up in all age categories, and all too often we'll have one age category blame the other age category, and we get into age wars in the churches and say, well, it's, it's the, the, the old folks are holding us back or the, the, the young folks want to change too much. Or we get in these wars instead of stopping, dropping the accusations, having a conversation and saying, what's really going on here? Why, where is this friction coming from in the church? Because what we just read in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22 was a picture of unity in the church. A picture of unity. But if you look at the churches in general across the United States, and we're not much of an exception, unfortunately, you will find that at times you have a few who are doing a lot and a lot who are doing very little. And it ebbs and flows. It changes. It changes. But it is a problem that seems to have plagued the church since its conception because those who do work hard, maybe if their work's not appreciated, they decide to check out, never help again instead of working with the relationships. See, religion can be clean cut. Relationships are messy. In a church, when you deal with relationships, it's, it can be messy. I believe here's, here's the three enemies. Individualism. Hold your horses. Nobody leave yet. Hang on. Hang on. Ineffective spiritual leadership. We as Americans are going to love the last one. Consumerism. Everybody ready to leave now before we dig into these? I believe these are the three enemies that keep us from finding unity in the church. Now, maybe you heard the word individualism and your red flags went up and you thought, hey, don't talk about that. Well, you're part of the problem tonight. Maybe you heard ineffective spiritual leadership and you say, hey, that's none of your business. You're part of the problem. Maybe you heard consumerism and you say, hey, that's none of your business. That's my right. Well, you're part of the problem. Okay, we're, we're talking about unity in the church and the things that are going to divide it is going to be when we get so focused on ourselves and what we have the rights to do with our time even, we forget about how the body is doing as a whole. That's the picture Christ had for the church. But let's, let's go one at a time. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. You know, we pray for unity. Jesus prayed for unity. We talked tonight. Uh, uh, Jeff even touched on uh, passages that bumped up on this Olivet Discourse. And uh, Jesus prayed for unity. But go to Acts chapter 4 right now. Acts chapter 4, verses 32 through 37.
Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of his possessions was his own, but instead they felt they held every, everything in common. Instead they held everything in common. Verse 33, and with great power the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was on all of them. For there was not a needy person among them, because all those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the proceeds of the things that were sold, and laid them at the apostles' feet. This was then distributed to each person as anyone had a need. Joseph, a Levite, and a Cyprot by birth, whom the apostles named Barnabas, which is translated son of encouragement, sold a field he owned, brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, some who might want to run away with this text would say, well, that's kind of a construct for socialism, and I completely disagree. No, socialism is a government-instituted, mandated platform by which they tell you your property is theirs. What we see here is a picture of believers getting together, sacrificing what they have so that another specific need can be met. That's generosity in a church. That's generosity, and that's what we're called to do. And you know what? I believe that's a strong point of this church. I see generosity in this church. And, and a lot of it, is many of you aren't going to know about, because I get to, a lot of times, get the blessing of seeing what's going on behind the scenes and people that give one-to-one, -one, not necessarily even through the church. And there's still even other situations that are gifts anonymous even to me that are designated for other people. This is a generous church. But that's with finances. Now, one, one thing that we're going to bump up against, especially in a hardworking community, is our time. Being generous with our time. And you say, Mike, well, this passage doesn't really talk about it. No, you're right. It doesn't target it explicitly. But the whole story of the early church is how they were meeting on a daily basis. They were very generous with their time towards the things of the church. I say, Mike, times have changed. Things have gotten busier. Really? Do we want to play that game? You really think our lives have gotten busy busier in our modern culture? I disagree 100%. It may be more chaotic and we have more options of what to do. But to live before we had many of the conveniences we do, it was a much harder life. It took a lot more time to do the basics, like cooking, for example and creating enough food to sustain a family. My point is simply this. It's easy to look at our culture around us and to make excuses and say, well, Mike, people are just busier than they used to be. No, they choose. They choose. It's a choice. And these, I'm, I'm calling this straight talk about the church because these are some things that we don't normally like to talk about because this gets personal. Well, it needs, we need to do self-examination here. But I want you, I want to hear from you for a second here. What, it, when it comes to individualism, how does this affect your regard for your wealth and your possessions? I just want to hear from you for a minute. What, have you used individualism as a license to hoard or to look after number one rather than somebody else? Or well, what's been your experience with individualism? What, what are the pros and cons? I believe there's some pros. What are the pros and cons, and what are those boundaries? You're being very individualistic with your opinions tonight. <laughs> I believe there's some pros to individualism. What, what might those be? I'm going to go to the toddler's class, and I'll be willing to bet I'm going to get more interaction over there. <laughs> you guys are starting to put me to sleep, okay? Now, that is that is a challenge. That's right. And what example, and uh, what Laura's pointing out, is she said with individualism, we each have our strengths. Now, can you think of an example in Scripture where we see God's plan bringing out individual strengths as a part of the body. What do we call those? Okay, that, yeah, we, we, we do have fruits of the Spirit that will come out, but yeah, spiritual gifts is where you 
that uh, with spiritual gift of mercy, teaching, prophecy. You see these different individual gifts, but what are those gifts to be used for? What do you say? They're all to be used for the edification of the believers. So even those individual strengths, again, individualism good there, yes, God has a unique role for every single person here. We're not cookie cutters. But we do fit into one big picture that's a lot bigger than ourselves, which means we've got to learn how to work with each other. I like participating in church discussions. Laura, Laura, if I will give you all the Snicker bars tonight if nobody else answers. You get every single one of them. My individual Snicker bars that I throw. Well, fine. You want to go from the kettle into the fire? We'll do that. Uh, how has individualism affected your participation in the church? Has it ever affected you one way or the other? Don't have the time? All right. You got you. It's your own world. It's your own world. You can do whatever you want. Okay, Kent's patting himself on the back. Do um, you want to elaborate a little bit more on that? Or? Well, with Kent, Kent, with you, I don't know. I just don't know. <laughs> he, he pat, Kent was patting himself on the back, and I said, do you want to elaborate? And he said, it's pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> How does it affect your participation in the church? Now, you're, I, I'm going to... I'm going to expand on this. Uh, are, are you saying that when you do even just a little bit, you pat yourself? Yeah, if we're not careful, the participation becomes about what we get out of it. That's, that's an individualistic perspective. Am I benefiting from this? Am I growing from this? Well, that's got to be part of the evaluation, but it's never the leading or final answer. It is about, am I benefiting God? And then, for any spiritual gifts, am I edifying the congregation? Is the congregation being ministered to? Or am I in the way? Now, the other way is, uh, this means a lot to me. This is important to me. Okay, well, get out of the way if it's important to you. This should be important to God and to the congregation. If you came to get cheered up tonight, it'll happen a little bit later on in the service. But the more you guys talk, the less I'm going to say, and maybe it will get cheerful. Paul's pointing out one danger is, as you expand on individuals, individualism is a little bit, is a committee, a class, a small group you're involved in, and you start obsessing over that little part of the church and, and what they want to do and what they believe is right or wrong, and you, f you start to forget about the rest of the church as a whole. You start generating your opinions in that class or in that group or in that study, and you start to think, this is the way we want to go, and this is the way the rest of the church should go with us, instead of remembering the family as a whole. There's, there's a term that we get to use in this church that not a lot of churches get to use anymore, and that is intergenerational family church. We get to use that here. We get to use that here, and I want to see us continue to using that here, to, to use that here, and one of the ways is going to be we continue to remember each other as a family, and we do not elevate one age above another. We continue forward as a family. That's right. And that, okay, and Kent, what Kent said, he said one of the things we've got to ask is even if we're doing something good, is it what God is calling us to do? That's one of Satan's lies is just do good, be good, be positive, do positive things, treat people positively rather than 
do what God has already told you to do or what God has called you to do. Ananias and Sapphira are going to come up next in the book of Acts. They did a good thing. They gave money to the church. But, <laughs> but they saw Barnabas, and, and they saw how, how much Barnabas was praised for what he did. And now Barnabas didn't do it for the praise. Barnabas would prove that later on. He just wanted to encourage people. The property he sold on Cyprus, it was very valuable property. So it was a big gesture to the church, a big gift. Ananias and Sapphira got caught up in the glory of that and the good, the, the morale that was kind of improved when Barnabas did that. And so they sold their property and they kept a chunk for themselves, but they said, we sold our property too and we gave everything as well. But God called them out on it through Peter. And even double check. So let me get this straight. You sold your property and gave all the money to the church? And then I said, yeah, man. Peter says, all right, man. God kills them. The wife comes in. A little Bonnie and Clyde duo. Except there was no shootout. Sapphira, did you give all the money to the church? Oh, yeah, of course, of course. Where's my husband? <laughs> Because you've lied, not just to us, you've lied to God. I have to take you out. Behold, the men that just carried your husband out, they're, they're waiting for you. There was no glory in that. That was punishment. They were not worried about the good of the church. But uh, the irony is God used them for the good of the church because that was now, you know why God did that? It, it would be explained later. It was a warning. I don't know if you want to be used as a warning label for the church. But tonight, I, I want us thinking about the body as a whole and not, not to be used as an example, but to be as an example of shame like Ananias and Sapphira, but as an example of leadership. So turn with me to Hebrews chapter 13 because this is a segue into our second second concern enemy for the church I believe is ineffective spiritual leadership Hebrews chapter 13 in the exhortation to the Hebrews it's concluded here in chapter 13 verse 17 Obey your leaders and submit to them, to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account, so that they can do with this they can do this with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. Pray for us, for we are convinced that we have a clear conscience, wanting to conduct ourselves honorably in everything, and I especially urge you to pray that I may be restored to you very soon. Now back up there in verse 17. Apparently, we don't think about this a whole lot. But you go through Scripture, and there is a structure for leadership in the church. And there are expectations for leadership in the church. There are qualifications for leadership in the church. And one of the, one of the admonitions is that the congregation support the leadership in the church. Now, normally, I like to do a This Day in History segment, okay? And uh, our This Day in History today will be Tom Gettle. Now, he had just turned 72, and I am still at this point in time 27. So our numbers are flipped right now at this point in time. Some days I am as grumpy as a 72-year-old. But anyway, <laughs> anyway. Tom, I said A. 72-year-old, okay? That, that could have... You what? You what? We'll try to and then, uh, did you say we're meeting at 8.30 tomorrow? Is that right? Okay. I'll have Daniel on the lookout with his Nerf guns. We'll be careful tomorrow, no. This day in history, <laughs> one of the things uh, that I, I had shared with you as a church, that 
when I first found out about this church, uh, initially I was embarrassed because I made the wrong phone call, and as I started to look into it, I found out you guys had a pastor who was still staying here as part of the pastoral staff, and that's a major no-no. You do not join a church as a pastor. That's just a no-brainer. You don't join a church as a pastor if the other pastor is still there. I could find no one on Johnson University, nobody in my family or any of the other pastors who thought that was a good idea. Do not go when the other pastor is still there. Well, I, I made uh, a couple phone calls, and you know some of that story. And what I was encouraged with is uh, Tom is one who supports the leadership and just wants to follow the leadership. He'll work with you. He'll work with you. And I thought, well, Lord, I'm willing to give it a shot if they're willing to give me a shot. And I, one of the things I can say about Tom Gettle, you know, and, and Tom, he could stand up here, especially after my commentary on him tonight. We could get up here, and I'm sure he could list a few concerns he has about the young preacher that came in from Tennessee. And I could list a few concerns that I, I have about Tom. We could share our pros and cons. But one of the things that's ministered to me the most about Tom is his support for the direction of the leadership at this church. I think that's one thing he, he demonstrates very well is the importance of supporting the leadership and being an example of what humble leadership looks like. And hopefully we still get a donut tomorrow. It, did, that, did that even out? Are we? <laughs> donut shop's closed tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> No, Casey's doesn't count for donuts. <laughs> Whoever said Casey's counts for donuts, I, you just lost credibility with me. <coughs> Hebrews chapter 13, the context is the church, and we're told, obey your leaders and submit to them. But here's, here's the flip side of this. This ought to scare the living daylights out of anybody in church leadership. For they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Whoa. One of the enemies of the church is going to be anywhere you find ineffective spiritual leadership. Good spiritual leadership isn't a charismatic speaker. That's not spiritual leadership. That's just a good show. If there are skills, that's all well and good, but unless they are backed by the truth of Scripture, they're useless. 1 Corinthians 13 would make that clear. You're just, all, you're just making a lot of noise if you've got a lot of skill, but no love. You're not preaching out of the Word. You're not speaking out of God's heart. It's worthless. It's just noise. Just like a Ford truck trying to get started in the morning. Making sure Todd's not at the computer, so we're good. We're good. We're safe. Without having a judgmental spirit. <laughs> all right, all right, all right long story behind that scandalous photo of me in a Ford pickup truck <laughs> smiling okay if you serve if you serve but not with effective spiritual leadership it is just like the obnoxious noise that comes out of a Chevrolet truck as it's trying to be started in the morning there, now we're even. It's just noise. It's just noise. If, if someone's not walking with God and doesn't have that personal relationship with God, it's just noise. That's one of the enemies of the church is when you get people in positions of leadership, they don't study the Word, they don't spend time in prayer, they're not actually walking with God, they're just using their position to influence and to sway and to keep things the way they want them. That will tear a church apart, that will drive away the health of a church, that will drive away families, that will drive away the work that Christ wants to do when they are not working in the power of God. Passages like 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7 said there are positions to be sought. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16, th this is where some were given to be apostles, some were given to be teachers, some were given to be preachers. There are roles handed out to benefit the entire congregation. Remember, edification of the body of believers, that's what it's about. 
ineffective spiritual leadership. And, and the, the unfortunate thing here is this can be faked by so many people. This can be faked for a season. But it will eventually show, and it's not pretty. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 12 through 13 talks about church leadership as well. as 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17, the importance of the spiritual maturity of the leaders in the church. That's huge. And you know, one of the things that contributes to that health is when the people of the church pray for the leaders. Here you thought you'd get away and we could just talk about church leaders tonight. Well, part of that is on the congregation. Are you praying for the leaders at this church? And is there, is there any way you help hold them accountable? What did you get out of God's word today? Today, not what are you preparing for Sunday's message or your Sunday school or your devotion. What did you get out of God's word today? That tells you there's a walk there. The last one was consumerism. Why do you think the consumer mentality is so prevalent among Christians right now? Give me. Entertain me. Give me what I want. This wasn't the attitude of the early church. We're breaking down into smaller and smaller subsets. What, wh why do you think that is? It's across all age ranges. Don't, don't just put it off on one older or younger age set. This is, this is everywhere right now. Why do, why do you think that is? That's what we've been taught. We are the most important thing. Yep. I, I believe instant gratification is part of it, that we're number one, and this isn't just out there. This is, this is in danger of continuing to seep in the church, too. You what? Yeah, yeah. I see. Right. That was, uh, we've never hooked up to television for that reason. We, we've watched movies and things like that, but we go to a hotel, you know, and we flip on the television, and so many commercials. I was just like, this isn't even inter this isn't even fun. We can't even really like just relax and watch a show. I we'd watch documentaries. That was our favorite thing. And we couldn't even. I mean, just so many commercials, and it was all about these products that you had to have, and it was just foolishness. Fast cars, what? Huh? See, I didn't even see the commercials. She said fast cars. I'm already interested. Yeah, there, yeah. There, there's there's filthy. That's right, fil filthy commercials out there. I had read an article last year about the, uh, it was a specific fast food chain that was using very sensual commercials to sell food. I'm like, what in the world? H how do we get to a place where they know, they know that if they can give us instant gratification in the way of sensuality in a commercial, that they've got our attention now for food? How sick is that? It's like we're, we're, we're trained house pets almost as, as humanity right now. Consumerism can be seen in the church, and we need to be aware of it. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, this is our final passage tonight, and we're, we're going to wrap up. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. These three enemies of the church. Individualism, ineffective spiritual leadership, and right now, cons <coughs> consumerism. I need new vocal cords if anybody's got any. These just are not getting any better. Walmart, I think, had a Cyber Monday sale on vocal cords, I think. Let's see if I can. Oh, wait, that's already passed. Never mind. Second Corinthians, and I'm in First Corinthians. Second Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 7. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God granted to the churches of Macedonia. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, now verse 2. During a severe testing by affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed into the wealth of their generosity. Did you, did you see these two words back to back? 
Did you, did you see deep poverty and generosity there? I testify that on their own, according to their ability and beyond their ability, they begged us insistently for the privilege of sharing in the ministry of the saints, and not just as we had hoped. Instead, they gave themselves especially to the Lord, then to us by God's will. So, we urged Titus that just as he had begun, so he should also complete his grace to you. Now as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all diligence, and in your love for us, excel also in this grace. We weren't people writing gifts off the top of their paychecks. These were people giving above and beyond. Giving of themselves towards not just a cause, but a need in the church. Now, th this church is, is good on generosity. But as you go through scriptures, it's easy. It's kind of a case study to look when it comes to finances. It's a little easier to talk about that because you can mark that off. It doesn't really require a whole lot of relationship. You know, you give it and, and you, you know, you give till it hurts. You know, we've learned, you, you know, you give till it hurts. You give as the Lord leads you. He'll never leave you empty. But in a pattern of growth in the church, one of the things I want to challenge us to is how we can continue to become more of a giver than a consumer in our relationships. That, that's where the rubber really meets the road, and that's the point of things like giving, is putting us into practice to not be consumers in our relationships. That's part of what this consumerism is. Maybe you heard consumerism, and you're thinking, well, stuff, yeah, that is, collecting stuff is a part of it, okay? But having an attitude of a consumer goes beyond just stuff. This goes into relationships. What do we expect out of the church? Do we come to the church as a consumer to be, have things brought to us, have music brought to us, ha have a message brought to us? Or do we come as a giver to give praise to the Lord, to give service to the Lord, to give our time to the Lord? You, you, you want to... You don't want your toes stepped on here in the next few seconds. Go ahead and pick them up and put them on the pew. Because if everyone here at this church was truly the kind of giver we're talking about, we would not have need to ask for volunteers in our ministry. They would be there. As a church, we're still hurting to find people to help and minister in many areas of service in the church. Part of that is I believe consumerism, since we live in America, is going to be something that we subconsciously do. Well, if I'm going to work at the church, I'm going above and beyond. No, you're not. No, you're just doing your part. Welcome to the family. You're doing your part. I mean, I don't know about you. My parents never paid me to do chores around the house. Now, I got paid to mow didn't expect it. It was offered to me. I never got paid to do chores around the house. You're part of the family. You do chores. That's what you did. And I always somehow try to get my brother to wash the dishes and try to get credit for it. It never worked. He always ratted me out. In a church, volunteering and serving in the church, is, it, it doesn't get you any extra credit or reward. It's what you do when you're part of a family. But when you have the attitude of a consumer, you don't have to worry about it. Everybody needs to serve you. You deserve to be served. All right, you can put your toes back on the floor. I actually heard somebody drop those boots back there. That was, that was good. Before you brush off the subject of consumerism, say, Mike, I don't... I don't really hear that word in the Bible. There's a lot of terms we use you don't really hear in the Bible, but this idea of consuming and taking and not giving, I, I want you to think about a verse that everybody here should know, John chapter 3, verse 16, and what's that? What, how does that verse start? That's right. What did he do with his only begotten son? For God so loved the world, he... When Jesus Christ came, what did he do with the riches of heaven? What did he do with those riches? Emptied himself of those riches. If anybody has a right to be a consumer, I would say it's the king of the universe. 
And yet his example was, I empty myself of all the riches. And he could have done that and still been born in a castle and nobody would have blamed him. And yet he, he decided to empty himself to his own riches to the point where later in his ministry he would say, guys, you're coming with me for the, <laughs> if you're coming with me for the traveling experience, you're going to be disappointed. Birds have nests. Foxes have dens. I don't even have a home. So anybody that tells you that the Lord wants you to be wealthy and prosperous is lying. The Lord wants you to find your fulfillment in Him. He will bless you with good things. And if He has blessed you with wealth, we'll praise Him for it and use it for His glory. But if that's not where you are in this stage of life, He's still blessing you. Blessing is not about the stuff He gives you. It's about being in His presence. It's about being in His presence. So I want us to be aware of these things. Individualism, yes, we still need to show our individual spiritual gifts and grow in the Lord one-on-one -on -one with Him in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. But remember that it's all for the church. It's not for us. It's so that we can glorify Christ by edifying the body of believers. In effective spiritual leadership, we all need to be walking in the Word daily. And if we are leaders in this church, that includes Sunday school, teachers, worship leaders, deacons, trustees, elders, any position, if you've accepted a position where you are over people in a church and you have responsibilities, you are held as one who is in, uh, held accountable for those under your care. Walk accordingly. Train in His Word accordingly. And if you struggle with consumerism, your time, your finances, your relationships, your opinions, if you struggle with having a self-focus in the way you approach things as how it will help and benefit you, give that up to the Lord tonight. These are enemies of the church and enemies of unity in the church. I want to make sure this church is centered on Christ. That is the only individual we focus on. This church is growing in Christ. That will lead to spiritual well-being. And we are a church that continues to grow in our gift of giving. I think that's a gift we have as a church is giving. Let's continue to grow in that. Let's give. Let's give. Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for your word tonight. I thank you for so many of the traits I've seen in this church. Lord, I've, I've not even been here two years yet, and yet there's so many unique things about this church that sets it apart from the quote-unquote statistics. You've brought good spiritual growth in this church, Lord, and I want to pray we continue taking the next steps. It's taken painful steps to get where they are, and Lord, I pray that together now we continue to follow you into the future. Heavenly Father, may we continue in a daily walk with you. It's not even always sensational. Sometimes it's simple. Reading your word, sharing our heart, hearing your words. Lord, may we continue faithfully in this track. May we pray for all the leaders in this church. And may we ask what we can give, whether of time, whether of finances, give to you for your glory and for the edification of the believers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.